Hello, and welcome back to Parlay. This prompt was written by Pistol Whip. Hope you'll enjoy listening. It's about a failure to communicate or a full-blown communication breakdown. Pistol Whip says, while I continue to slowly assemble communication parlay number three, Tokyo Drift, <laughs> here's an interim parlay featuring a clip from when supernatural battles become commonplace in anime. An anime about the dark flame hidden in protagonist Jurei Ando's right hand. This is technically a plot spoiler, so I hope that Captain either has already watched it or doesn't mind a slight peek into one of the mid-season conflicts. Yes, I have already seen this. Um, I it is it is a little bit of a spoiler. I I think this is okay though. You know, if this is a series you might enjoy, maybe this will be the reason you'll watch it rather than uh, ruining it necessarily. And it's a pretty legendary piece of voice acting too. So uh, yeah, let's um, let's get into it. Hatako. Jirai's childhood friend has put up with his chuni-isms for years. She tries her best to understand, but most of it just goes over her head. Still, she tries to stick with it for the name of love and friendship. And chunibio, or middle schooler syndrome, is the translation, I think. Um, uh, chuni-isms. Uh, uh, this is like your edgy platitudes that don't mean anything, like uh, the the... I, it's very difficult to say while taking myself seriously, but the dark flame hidden inside of my hand, or uh, my I can only barely hold back my power. Um, but it, there's just absolutely nothing out of the ordinary happening at all. You're just being an edge lord, <laughs> uh, that type of thing. Or uh, you know, adding a, a profuse adjectives to things is another aspect of Chunibio that I think is humorous. Um, like it, it's it's not just the scythe. You see, it's the black flame scythe, you pedant. Uh, it's I can't believe you would forget the the full title of my apocalyptic slash technique, uh, that type of thing. Okay, so that's the realm that we're in. Is, does that do you follow me a little bit? It's okay if you're like what why, that's sort of the point. It's okay. Then one day, Judai dismisses Hatoko's attempt to understand with "you wouldn't understand." As quickly becomes evident, this isn't the first time he's said that to her, but this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. She breaks down and vents all the frustration she's been bottling up in a long tirade that shows just how much she's been listening, even if she can't understand. And Judai just stands dumbfounded as she bursts into tears and runs off. I'm highlighting this clip as an example of failed communication where both parties clearly put in a lot of effort, but failed to meet in the middle because Jukun is an idiot. <laughs> no specific prompts for this one, just prodding for reactions, analysis, anecdotes, etc. Cool, so first of all, I'll leave the clip, uh, a link to the clip in the description. Give it a watch. Um, it's a noteworthy piece of voice acting, if absolutely nothing else. Um, and if you have participated in internet culture, in almost any way, in any time in the past couple decades since this video went up, you'll probably relate somewhat to this. Uh, first, some basic analysis. It's interesting because we have, uh, I think, not necessarily the focus of the situation, uh, but a, a character who is being, uh, who understands even less than most people, I think, what is going on here. I think most people would eventually get the idea that the person is just trying to sound cool, you know what I mean? They would understand that they're not supposed to understand. And I think that uh, Hatoko is genuinely slightly distressed that she does, like she wants to really understand, which I think a lot of people j don't, straight up don't. Either don't care enough about the other person, or just don't see there as being something you would understand. They feel like they do understand. It's noteworthy, in other words, that Hatako even thinks she doesn't understand. That is not as common as it might appear. And I think it comes from a touching desire to actually understand someone that I, I'm not sure is all that common. And I am going to talk about that a lot in this parlay, but I feel like that's a noteworthy thing to point out. It's not just her being frustrated that he keeps saying these edgy things. She's frustrated because she wants to actually understand and is failing to do that. Arguably, uh, the part of the problem is that Ando Judai is, is not trying to communicate in a way that can be understood. Um, he is not really communicating, um, saying things in a way that isn't 
I don't think about understanding. It's slightly comical, ironic of him to say you wouldn't understand. It's more like there is nothing to understand, at least in my opinion. It's interesting some of the things she points out. She really mentions a lot of specifics. I like uh, Pistol Whip, how you said uh, it shows just how much she's been listening. She names many, many specific details of edgy things that he's said in the past that she didn't get that are either not really understandable, like there's no real content to them, uh, adding edgy adjectives to the name of your secret weapon that can cut the universe in half. Uh, you know, they, they don't mean anything really. Uh, why is it the Black Flame Scythe? You know, because shut up is the reason, right? But then there are also examples of him kind of hand-wavingly having explained. Uh, there's one that's like uh, explaining, you know, gravitational, like some physics phenomenon or something that she basically claims that he just quickly looked up on the internet and then started referencing as this like cool thing where you could maybe understand, you know, if somebody hand-wavingly explains such a thing, you might be genuinely confused and feel like, well, that does exist, that's just not a good explanation of it. Uh, it sounds annoying, right? I've definitely experienced people like this in my life, um, and I can relate to her a little. I have, actually, in my life before, had a similar conversation where I was in Hatako's shoes, uh, talking to someone in my life about not really a way that they communicate with me, but a way they were frustrated with how other people were reacting to them. And I eventually snapped a little bit, if I'm being honest, and it kind of chewed them out, saying, you know, you are walking all over them. You're like, you're not thinking about them. That's why they're, you know, you're not, you're not getting through to them. It's because you're not trying. Like, you're really not trying. Uh, you think you are. You're behaving in a way that makes you feel like you, it, it's not you that's being misunderstood, but it is. You know, you you need to actually try to be understood if you don't want to be misunderstood, which isn't the exact same situation as here. But uh, my experience was not an anime, and so what you would expect, maybe I should say, what do you think would happen if you if you confronted someone with that? I'll give you a second if you like you know, they will absolutely not accept it most of the time. It takes strength of character to understand that you have been vehemently lying to yourself and this person absolutely did not hear the thing that I was trying to say. I may have presented it badly as well. This was a good bit earlier in my life. Um, I'm not trying to say I'm not at fault. Um, will Hatako's outburst to Judai be effective in this case you know what i mean well you'll have to watch the show and see what happens but i think it's worth considering that in normal life this goes beyond just something that people often wouldn't accept they wouldn't feel the emotional impact the way that he seems to in this scene they not only wouldn't feel that they would likely deny the existence of the thing you were saying they would say you know that you just don't understand they would maybe double down um, I think that's because it is difficult to put yourself really in another person's shoes and understand that they are trying. You know, what What I want from Judai is to see that Hatako was trying to understand the whole time. But that is difficult to do. Uh, being able to understand when someone is trying, even though they are failing, in other words, without the cheat code of seeing the evidence of their success so you know they're trying, is challenging. Like, that is a hard thing to do. I have uh, my current partner is a fantastic example. This is one of the quieter people I have ever met. I've been close to a couple of people like that, that the, the way they're behaving, if you really think about it, it doesn't really make sense that they anything other than care, but it sure doesn't feel like they do moment to moment in their raw actions. It will feel like they're not expressing, you know, anything <laughs> and so you can't help but feel like well if you won't do anything surely you can't care that much uh, but that just isn't the reality for a lot of people and indeed it's been interesting to see how that's changed in my relationship sure i'm a, a pretty direct person <laughs> nowadays and so it's interesting to see how that has affected my relationship um, it's been very successful and all but just to say that it definitely started differently when i met this person in my life it wasn't like this, you know, they, it was strange interacting with them. In some ways, 
for me, because I was so obsessed with understanding better, and we'll get into that in a minute, it was easier to recognize that this person, you know, gave a heck about me because she took actions where I had seen her take inaction so consistently. But it's all too often that people will have tried really hard and will uh, will not have been understood. I don't mind sharing something a little personal, a formative moment in my time getting to know this person, though this was almost 10 years ago now. Uh, we met in college, and very early in college, and briefly dated before spending quite a long time not dating. Uh, so this is very different from our current relationship or getting to know each other. Uh, we're more or less different people, but this is a thing that happened that I'm somewhat embarrassed to say I did. Uh, but it was an important formative moment to me that was like this. Um, I've been on the receiving end of this happening to me too. I was dating a few people in college, and you can already see that this is a problem. Not because necessarily that couldn't work, but because the problem with being with multiple people is nearly always logistics, in my opinion. Uh, it's not a matter of it being somehow wrong or unworkable to be with multiple people. Uh, a lot of people bring up jealousy, which is, uh, in my opinion, in the grand scheme of things, a minor issue, but that's a topic for another time. And because it can be assuaged, I, I think. Um, I think it's telling that for a lot of people, that is what seems like the problem. The real problem, in my humble opinion, is logistics, is it not feeling like it if not causes people to compare their situation to other people, just plays up the things that they're not succeeding at that they want to. A self-critical person may be driven slightly crazy by feeling like they can see so clearly where their time with you is falling short of other people's time with you. And this may not be a matter of jealousy comparing to the other person. It may be a matter of crushing self-critique, where there's no way to escape the reality of the thing that you want to do better, but you can't just snap your fingers and be a different person. I was not careful enough about this with this person in my life. And I remember a time when we were, uh, we were in the same apartment together toward the middle of my time in college. And... I said, uh, just haphazardly, lackadaisically, uh, like I wanted, you know, a hug or some random affection or whatever. We were just hanging out, having ice cream in the middle of the night. And I said, you know, wiggle, wiggle, love me. And she really s stuck her fist down and said, I'm trying to, like, I can't, like, stop saying that. And I immediately realized in this case, at least to my minor credit, um, Oh crap, I've been saying that a lot, not meaning love that way, but you know that that's going fine for me with other people I'm close to, and you're trying to do it better, and you can't, and you're frustrated, and that's not your fault. It's kind of my fault, because I'm not trying as hard as I could be. I didn't notice that you're, in hindsight, quite obviously struggling with this part of our relationship, and have been carelessly almost unintentionally mocking you is is what it's like. It was a terrible thing of me to say, and I I felt terrible. I still feel kind of terrible, uh, but I don't think it's bad to admit that I did that. Uh, it came from a place of me doing exactly what's happening here in a way, not taking the time to think about what I was communicating, focusing on me and what I meant to the detriment of what I will get is how I think of it. It would be easy to say that the problem is that I was being self-centered, but I think that that is not the full picture or the most helpful way to think of it, because being self-centered is good if you don't suck. <laughs> if you are around other people who are in touch with their feelings, it's very inconvenient to not be in touch with and express your feelings. It's bad to express your feelings and be selfish if you are an idiot, <laughs> which I was, because what I wanted was, was really affection. I just wasn't approaching it in a thoughtful way. If I had really thought about what I wanted and cared about what I wanted enough, seriously enough, to do what was required to get that thing, I would not have said such a careless and thoughtless thing to my partner. I would have thought about how I would get to that thing that I want, 
and things could potentially be hunky-dory after doing this for, oh, a couple of years, let's say. Uh, may maybe after, you know, five or so years of personal growth. Uh, just, just purely hypothetically. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's not like we dated after a gap of half a decade. And it went really well. Uh, so yeah, I, um, I personally, I think that an interesting way to view this type of miscommunication is that the person failing to communicate, saying things that seem to be kind of not bothering to try to get the help the other person understand or get on the same page, um, that person is it, it incompletely expressing the thing they want. Like they are doing something wrong for them, not necessarily just for the other person. Sure, they're communicating, flapping their gums, wasting their breath on something that it, it means nothing to the people around them. Sure, it's pointless for people other than them, but it's also pointless for them. They are not fulfilling the goal of communicating for themselves. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's interesting in the concept of the sort of Chinibio stuff, because it's difficult to pin down what the desire is a concept that I think about a lot is this idea of whether a, a motivation for a human being, let's say, will survive being investigated all the way to its root. In other words, if you take Judai's desire to talk about his Black Flame Scythe all the way down to its roots, what is the core desire? What is the core cause of him speaking that way? Will that thing survive becoming known? You see what I mean? If you actually knew about and had full control over that motivation, would you still have it? Let's take a look. So uh, I think that when people express uh, th these edgelordisms, part of what's going on is it's kind of like an aspirational purchase for your personality. You want things to be like that. It's a form of escapism, maybe. But you also want to be like that. You would like it to be that you had your own personal like sexy way to talk about your cool idea for a fantasy weapon or something let's say but to have an artistic opinion about that subject would be to be vulnerable in a way that you are not secure enough to be and that's okay people are insecure all the time but i think the difference is that this is kind of a cheat it's like you let yourself have it a little bit but it's not yours it's just it, it was shocking to me listening to uh, Hatoko's rant, how many of the things she said, I was like, this is just a list from most to least commonly used edgy things to say in perfect order. Like someone used that function where you can like look up how often a term has been used and order them from the absolute most common like edgelord thing to say. And then they took like the top 50 of those, the exact top 50 that we somehow all objectively agree are the top 50. We we don't, I guess, but I totally did. I was like, wow, this is like reading the dictionary of the most used, you know, edgy slang things to say. Um, it was crazy. I, they did a great job with that part. It was very in touch with that part of culture. And so the point is, they're like the least original things. They're not you expressing your personality, they're you copy-pasting a personality. <laughs> Rather than doing the thing that makes you really a person, which I would argue is to be less in the middle. Do more things that either literally anyone would do, or only you would do, and less things that a defined subset of people would do. This makes you less predictable, which is not necessarily a virtue, but I think that's a side effect of being more of a person. You do things that are particular to you when they're appropriate. That is, you've optimized pursuing the things you actually want rather than taking a lazy way forward. And you also don't bother doing that when there's no need. You know, just do the normal thing. There's no need to get anxious about not being your own individual when doing some basic interaction. You don't have to say hello to the cashier in a new way every single time to avoid being seen as like a normie or a robot. That is irrelevant. No one cares. <laughs> I assure you, you won't sound unique if you try not to sound like everybody else. You will sound like everyone else who has that motivation. <laughs> and I think that when people are young in particular, they simply don't know that, right? I think a lot of the, the like middle schooler syndrome part of the Chunibio thing is that one reason this often goes away later on is that you become painfully aware of just how common 
it is to say those exact same things, which kind of puts a damper on the subject. It almost proves a little bit that it's coming from a place of wanting to be special, I guess, or feel like your own person, that people often stop doing it if they know just how common it is for other people to do it. That's not eminently clear at first. It feels like finding a secret thing only you and maybe a few other people know about on the internet. But if you know that it's like, no, that's extremely widely understood. Everybody thinks about this or, you know, knows about this. Then it loses some of its magic. You, you get the point. Um, and so I think that if you go all the way down to the core desire of expressing your edgelord sentiments, that core desire is, um, I mean, it's heavily up for debate, by the way. You might disagree with the way I formulated it. But I think it's it's enough for this discussion to say that it's basically insecurity, like wanting to feel secure, wanting to feel like you're your your own person with your own feelings and you can express them and wear your heart on your sleeve or whatever. And you can see that, that that motivation conflicts. If you fully understand the context of the thing you're doing, saying things that actually a lot of other people say they don't really mean anything, but then the real thing you want is to be genuinely understood, that's fundamentally incompatible with the thing you're doing, and so the result is that you will stop doing it. In other words, it doesn't survive being fully understood. It may be that no human desires fully understand, uh, fully survive being fully understood. Uh, but I think there are some that might. For example, I think novelty so far is doing pretty well in the horse race. I've tried very hard so far in my young life to push novelty very far as a motivation. And I don't, it seems like it's going to hold out for at least quite a while longer. Uh, it seems like a good thing to care about overall. I do think some amount of pursuit of novelty is an, an act of anxiety. Um, it's a, a desire to get away from what is known because you know the way that it makes you anxious. Uh, but I do think it goes well beyond that. Uh, being comfortable, everything leads to novelty. That's a good sign, in my opinion. Taking almost any actions and succeeding or failing often leads to novelty. Uh, people of many different experiences and maturity levels agree that novelty is pleasant, which I think is a not really an argument for it, but that's a good sign. And having thought through a lot of other arguments and seen that a lot of other people have thought through a lot of other arguments for novelty, it seems promising. Uh, just as a, a side note example, if you're feeling depressed about will any human desire survive being fully understood, there are some good ones. I, I It's fine. Um, I think, l not really love, I guess, but very serious relationships, like lifetime level relationships, partners, are also a, a pretty good, better than I thought they were a little while ago. Um, I think that one of the key breakthroughs is understanding that it, the the uniqueness of the person is a, a, irrelevant, complicated, but irrelevant. Um, and it's much more about what you have been through with them and that they are the person that is here. Uh, I don't think that it's impossible for anyone else to have kind of stepped up and expressed themselves. Any other super quiet people than my particular partner to have stepped up and said something. In fact, I've met one other person that comes to mind in a similar way, but well, this was a bit different. This is the person that did it. You know, I don't really care how common or uncommon or special that is. That's not required for this person to be important to me. They're important to me because they are the one that did it. I don't care how commonplace or not that thing is. Neither do I overvalue it. Um, I don't think it's so special. I think that if someone else had come along and been open to this person expressing themselves, yeah, like I would have been replaceable in that moment. But not anymore, because now we've been through this entire thing together. That's what it is. The idea is not so much that it's disappointing and you just have to live with that. But just that our expectations, possibly set up by the way our culture talks about romance, are unfounded, like they, they're misaligned, they don't really make sense. The beautiful part isn't the story uh, at the beginning, you know, the little inciting incident. Um, we're not a book, like this is our lives. Uh, it, it doesn't work the same way. More like a video game than a movie, maybe. 
uh, where playing through it is the fun part rather than the thing you played through. The VODs of the gameplay you did are not the important part. It's the gameplay in, in this case. Is that <laughs> that's kind of, anyway? I think that's not a bad metaphor, actually. Maybe we'll see. Um, so going back to the communication thing, I think this is important because to communicate well, there are some ingredients that are deceptively difficult to acquire. One of them is to more thoroughly explore the goal of the communication. Now, some goals are so shallow and so not really worthwhile, but just required that it seems possible to communicate in everyday life in a very reasonable way without investigating them thoroughly. For example, we've talked in previous parlay about how people will do kind of nicisms in everyday life. And this is because we understand that to get things done as humans living together, even if we've thoroughly investigated how we're like hilariously not really trying to understand the other person's perspective, that just isn't what this communication is about. The purpose of this communication is, you know, careful, polite, uh, often for the sake of safety, acknowledging the other person being there or doing a sort of security check. You know, I agree that I've paid for these goods and services and you also agree that and you say have a nice day, which doesn't mean you want me to have a nice day. And it's not that it doesn't mean that, but it doesn't mean that as much as it means our transaction is complete. I'm confirming that that's okay, so you don't have to worry about it. That's surprisingly important as you think about it more. We we really need you to do that. <laughs> um, it's not a matter of, uh, of a courtesy necessarily as much as it is part of the transaction. You kind of have to do that thing. But that's not really the same thing because it's arguably not communication. It's more like a machine for doing business made of words. It uses the same mechanism as communication, but really isn't communication, it is my current opinion, partially developed by your own parlay requests over the past few months, Pistol Whip. Um, it's really not like shallower communication, it's just literally not communication, is how I would think of it. Again, it's more like a device that we use to do business. Whereas uh, what I would view as actual communication, in my definition, my way of thinking of it, kind of requires that there is a somewhat well-investigated purpose to the communication. If the person you're communicating with cannot stop glossing over misunderstandings, they won't say if they don't understand. In other words, it is pointless to communicate with them. Full stop, it is pointless to communicate with them. You might still talk with them because talking with people is used for things other than actual real communication of, info, of connecting and trying to understand something together. Um, but you won't be really communicating with them. A lot of the time that I talk to people on the stream in Twitch chat, I am saying things that are maybe misguided. It's difficult to do with people you've just met on the internet. I'm trying to establish communication and just failing, or I don't know a better way to go about it yet. For example, I can think of a few times when uh, a new person entered the chat and chimed in on a topic we were discussing. And I noticed pretty quickly, because it's not that hard to notice, we pattern obsessed humans, that they seemed to be used to a culture of communication that is is pretty ineffective, you know, where people kind of don't make actual points. Um, it's, it's often easy to see in our stream because people relatively consistently nowadays make large, thoroughly thought out points. And so you can often see when a person, it's hard to describe, I don't think I can describe this effectively, but words things in a way where it seems clear that they have not been in a space like that much before, or the way that they've talked about things, the real arguments have not confronted their perspective very often. What often happens if, the, if, if that occurs is that making just your own reasoned point about the subject not a big deal if one person is right or wrong, that's not really the point or a thing that exists or it, it doesn't really matter, we're just here to discuss, will seem to the other person who isn't used to this level of going into detail about your point, it will seem like they're try you, you are trying to categorically disprove their existence. Like you're, you're trying to present a thesis on why they're wrong rather than just normally presenting lots of thoughts. Like that's just normal. 
If you could instantly inject into their brain the context that this we do this for literally every single point that comes up on the stream every day or three times a week and have done so for years, they would pretty quickly realize that it's of no consequence that you're going on in some detail about just what you think. No one has said they may not have noticed that they're like so wrong or such an idiot for thinking that. You're just presenting the things you think. And I've often had people who, it, from my perspective, it's weird, will react like, no matter what you say, you can't convince me that you're right. And I'll think I literally never even said I'm I'm trying to convince you or that I am right. <laughs> um, I'm just saying thoughts I have that, you know, come from the point you made. But from their context, things are not like that. And I think that part of the problem is that the 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 ability to establish like that misunderstanding is so common or like you can you can give a point in great detail and people cannot understand and that actually happens a lot in normal life but for most people they have experienced many times that people have kind of pretended to understand but didn't that's a lot like you're not probably going to be able to get that across to people in a casual stream environment in one sitting that person would need to stick around and chat for a while and then maybe they would just get it through context but getting that person to understand that or even accept that you could you could even just say hey you've probably had people in your life who you explain this to and they said oh yeah i you know i agree that's a great point and they really didn't read what you said at all they would just not believe you you know what i mean like they would just not accept that they would say everybody agrees with this point i tell it to people all the time and they say they agree when in fact if we could become all-knowing and and check their work which we can't do we would almost certainly find that like 90% of those people essentially didn't read what they said and said that they agree to smooth things over socially because this is how a lot of people communicate. It's just not based on actual communication and understanding. But to understand that would under to, would be to understand that most of their life has been like kind of people coddling them, which is sort of fine, but it probably won't feel fine from their perspective and so they're not going to have a, a complete personality overwrite right on the spot. They're just going to say that you're wrong. <laughs> like, they're going to say you're nitpicking and biased. I win bye bye, which like that's understandable. I think that most people do not have time, period, full stop, to understand other people ever for forever. Uh, and it's essentially just pointless to attempt like on the topic of actually understanding if understand means anything we're getting on the same page that is pointless 99 percent of all human conversations um it's not mentally possible for the person to do what is required to understand it would require completely deconstructing their entire personality for them to really understand the thing that you're talking about and i think to some extent that's just not necessary i mean you can still have partial understanding that's not so bad it's pretty interesting to me, as someone who's kind of obsessed with deep understanding, there's no total understanding, um, while being someone who's aware of how difficult that is, which might be less common than you'd think, I'm not trying to brag, but I think it's uh, common to meet people that desperately want to understand, but purely out of a slightly delusional sense of insecurity, not willing to accept that they won't be understood most of the time. I am relatively at peace with that. The internet helps, it really does. I think making videos where you try to explain an involved perspective on something and not even really hearing what most people thought afterward. Like, I know that 90% of people didn't really get the point. I know that 33% of my audience watches the things that I make like to feel smart. I don't think the things I'm saying are so smart. It's just, it, it's a, it's a well, you know, a well thought out, just meaning I thought about it a lot opinion. And that can be satisfying to hear, I guess, because it's weirdly uncommon. And I'm at peace with that. I mean, I don't, I kind of wish that wasn't the case, but there's nothing I can do about that. I mean, what even would you do about that? So I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, just food for thought. Uh, I think uh, that the, the, the thing that is okay is to reach some partial understanding. It's interesting for me, I was saying, as someone who's pretty obsessed with reaching, you know, deep understanding, it's not going to be perfect. Even knowing how difficult that is, it's pretty interesting for me to keep in touch with a few friends that really don't have the time to pursue that kind of thing. 
but still uh, sort of want to, in my opinion, anyway. It kind of feels like they enjoy it when we get closer, but they just really, really don't have time to do that. They don't even really have time to understand how much we're not doing that. Uh, like how if you haven't climbed a mountain, you don't know just how high it is once you've been half the way up and you look up and it's still so high. That whole phenomenon. And that itself is very interesting, like seeing the way in which you can get on weirdly the same page, like without thorough communication, uh, a real point of growth for me as someone who definitely was once wanting to pursue understanding out of pure insecurity, like just because I felt I was scared that people wouldn't misunderstand when that's like, it's impossible for them not to like you, they're gonna misunderstand. <laughs> um, it's still good to try, but I mean, it's not going to be perfect. Um, it's pretty impressive how close people can get if they try, if they really put in the effort. I think in some ways that Hatako in her monologue understands Judai just fine in a way. She understands that he's being an idiot. I, I completely agree with the way Pistol Whip put it. Uh, she doesn't understand the specifics of the communication that he's that is coming out of his mouth but i mean he doesn't understand the real motivations behind the communication that's coming out of his mouth what she understands is that he doesn't understand i i i think this is a, a, a possibly effective communication in a way um, it it is an example of uh the results maybe of failed communication when you really want to communicate. But I think that this clip could be seen as how you do meet in the middle. If you really want to communicate with someone and they just they just horribly fail, uh, where both parties clearly put in a lot of effort. Well, <sighs> Judai put in a lot of effort to be an edgelord very inefficiently pursuing his actual desires that he doesn't know about yet. That's okay. Mm, so I guess he did put in a lot of effort, but it's... Mm, yeah. Anyway, uh, I, I thought this was an interesting subject to bring up. Uh, it was It's tricky. I have a lot to say about this one, and this time uh, with Parlay, I tried to approach the, the sort of show notes thing that I do before Parlay for a few minutes a little bit differently than I normally do. I tried to write a lot more than I thought I would use, and then not use any of them. Like I did touch on some of those topics. But a problem I have is that in my somewhat misguided desire to communicate more completely, I feel like I'm failing unless I communicate everything. And I have been trying to say to myself, before parlay and streams are a place where I have a problem with this too, you will fail to communicate everything or fully. You cannot not miss a good point you might have made or a fun thing you might have said or like one of the audience members' comments. It's nice to try to fit a lot of them in, but trying to fit all of them in is stupid. Like, you you know it won't work. It will make the ones you do cover worse. You know, that that's not that's not effective. I think there's a big difference between, I, I at least I hope I'm effectively living this philosophy. It would be good to see a big difference between. I'm not sure if I am. Trying to pursue a lot of communication rather than insisting that anything other than complete communication is failure, which is definitely something I have been guilty of in the past, may still be guilty of. Throwing, as you might say, the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> so let's see if I do any better at that after these. Uh, Pistol Whip, these have been fun. Um, I'm, I, I like that you did this little detour one. Uh, I'm looking forward to communication number three.